It's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you today about new manufacturing initiatives at General Electric. We term it the Berlin Factory, and it's really all about the digital threat and how do we get to 21st century manufacturing using that digital threat to improve efficiency, productivity, and quality. Let me first tell you a little bit about General Electric. Um, most of you probably know General Electric makes uh, refrigerator white goods and light bulbs, but that's really a very small part of the business. The biggest parts are power and water, where we make uh, gas turbines, steam turbines, uh, with about $20 billion in revenue. All in gas, which is really GE's growth engine right now, we grew that within about 15 years from a billion dollars in sales to about 18 billion today. Aviation, we are the, the biggest manufacturer of jet engines. We have about 70% market share in the commercial market. And uh, healthcare, you probably know that GE invented the MRI and other really important technologies in that space. Again, another $18 billion in sales. And then we also make locomotives. We have businesses in energy management and uh, home and business solutions where lighting and, uh, and the white goods sits. And then finally, GE also has a capital division, which we are shrinking. So we're shrinking it to grow it. You probably all remember that GE at some point was, was termed an uh, industrial corporation uh, that has a bank, or better, a bank that, that also has a, a sidearm of, of, of industrial uh, industrial sales. Uh, we have been shrinking that from about 700 billion ENI to about 350, so it will be only 30 percent of, uh, of General Electric's portfolio. And the purpose of GE Capital is really to support the industrial sales. It, it, we don't really want to be in the business anymore of, uh, of lending people money just for, for lending sake, so there should be a, there should be a strategic reason why you want to uh, engage in, uh, in a financial transaction with a customer. GE Global Research was really the first industrial research lab founded around 1900. And uh, it's really market-focused R&D. So uh, for me, as a manufacturing guy, that means usually we're focused on product. But now that even that is changing, we realize that uh, it is very important for us to not only be a leader in performance, but also be able to reduce our cost and thereby improve uh, not only our margins, but also the opportunities for our customers. We have eight global sites, uh, and the, the headquarters of that is in upstate New York. So as we are moving from doing just product research to manufacturing research, we, we are asking ourselves, so what are the forces? What, what are the changing forces right now? in manufacturing, and, and it's really astounding uh, what's going on in that space. Our chairman, his focus is on advanced manufacturing. Wow, when, when was that the case the last time? You worked for a last industrial, industrial corporation that the chairman said, you know, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, this is really what I need to improve right now. But the reason is that the, the world is changing. So we have so much data available coming from our uh, coming from our robots, from our weld controllers, from our PLCs, from MESs, from any three-letter alphabet soup you can think of. And what do you do with all those data? But it's also all about including our suppliers into our supply chain. We realize that we cannot do it all alone. We typically source about 80% of, uh, of our products through, uh, from suppliers. And th therefore, to be, to be more agile and more nimble, it becomes very, very important to us that we are engaged with our suppliers and that we realize that they have a lot to offer. And then finally, and we'll talk about this more during the panel, through the advent of additive manufacturing, we are really get, getting a global and distributed manufacturing space. So you have like a lot of companies we are engaging with that now offer you uh, to design Whatever you, whatever you want to design, they make it for you, and they ship it to your door. And it's not only just startups, you know. We engaged about a couple of weeks ago, we, we were at UPS. They had their uh, annual leadership conference, and they wanted to focus on 
What's going to disrupt our business model? And UPS is engaging in trying to figure out what's additive manufacturing going to do to them because, well, these products supposedly don't have to be shipped anymore. And what does it, what does it mean for their business model? So the supply chain as a whole is really being redefined. And if you look at the McKinsey report that came out on, on the 12 trends that is going to change, the, uh, change in, the, in the beginning of the 21st century, the industrial landscape, really there are six of them that are touching advanced manufacturing. You see them here, the check marks are the ones that we believe will touch advanced manufacturing significantly afterwards. Rodney Brooks is going to give the keynote on robotics, clearly another really important area that's going to change both manufacturing, healthcare, and a bunch of other things. So we are really moving from a component, product-driven world to a systems world. And if you think about what have been, what have been the, the innovations in lately that have changed the world and that have really garnered the majority of the profits, it's all about ecosystems. I mean, look at the iPhone. I mean, yeah, it's a nice device, but really it's all about the app store, right? And there are a bunch of other examples, and we think additive manufacturing can play a similar role. So we really think that we are at the beginning of the third industrial revolution, and the two topics I want to talk to you about in more detail this afternoon is additive manufacturing and virtual manufacturing at the Berlin factory that you know, combine, in our opinion, something what we call smart manufacturing. And this is really all made possible through the digital threat. And then I'll leave some time for discussion. So additive manufacturing, is that the next assembly line or what is really the change? Well, it enables a different kind of manufacturing and it enables this through a digital threat. So you could sit in your living room and design a new part, have it made by a company, let's say like Plethora, and have it shipped back to you within a few days. Now, there are a lot of challenges with that, of course. Validation of engineering, structural integrity, uh, material costs, and so forth. We are very much at the beginning, and of course, you know, most of you know this is 20-year-old technology that has been used for prototyping, and only now we are getting to the point of where we're using it for making actual products. But it's really remarkable of what it can do. For us, in our, in our jet, en jet engine business, it's really helping us reduce weight. Because as you build these, these uh, parts additively, you can design what wasn't possible before. Because you essentially build them up just like a 3D printing machine. And it, it allows you to come up with, with designs and functionality, and thereby what's important for us, weight savings, that really was, was impossible before. And we have made a big commitment. We uh, now putting this technology in our, in our newest engine that's going to come out in 2016. We are single source to Boeing on that. We have made uh, very aggressive promises in terms of fuel economy for, for these engines. And we have to use additive manufacturing to achieve those targets. And it is invention on schedule. So we have to be there. We'll make it. We know we'll make it. But it's a, it's a very different kind of invention as if you first invent, then think about the application, and, and you're sure uh, w when you're going to put it out. So it's, it's, it's quite an interesting interesting business model, but in the aviation space where you only get every 10 or 15 years to bid on a certain engine, you have to do it in that way. You have to assume a little bit more risk, and then you mitigate those, those risks essentially through scientists and more scientists that, uh, that help you with, uh, with implementing those technologies.